Hi, how's it going? This is Resident of Colorwood for YouTube. I'm back to uh, continue my read-alongs of Tibetan Gao. Sorry for the delays. Uh, book 5, Chapter 14. New Betrayals and New Beginnings. Uh, I'm sorry, New Betrayals and New Beginnings. Uh, the afternoon <laughs> chill seemed colder than the day before. There was no fresh snowfall, but the air was cold enough to keep the small bits of moisture frozen on the leaves and trees around the island. A few hours before the dinner bell rang at Terramore House, uh, Jacob, Celeste, Lear, the two boys, Fabian and Gabriel, and Gabriel's new teacher, Corey, uh, Tyler, or Corey, <laughs> that girl, uh, I'll, I'll get into it, uh, sat in the adjoining parlor next to the dining room and dressed and ready for dinner. Corey had been welcomed into the household via Lear's invitation, who had hired her on behalf of his lord cousins to help with Gabriel's learning to communicate by sight via sound, signs and gestures. It was early in his teaching, he as he was nearing a year old, but Corey was sure of her process. I mean, Corey was sure of her, of herself, of her, how she was, to sort of put a definition on it, Corey is sure of her talents, that the process she's allow that she is, the process of the way she is teaching uh, Gabriel is allowing him to pursue further. Uh, that's what that means. I, I had a, I have two special needs children. <laughs> um, as the group sipped, uh, brandy by the fire it made such a small talk of Gabriel's small but growing progress Jonathan Devinning suddenly walked in well aren't you a sight for sore eyes Celeste said to her younger brother who she'd been a bit irritated with in the last day few days I'm still welcome to dinner aren't I Jonathan asked sarcastically of course we're happy to be you're here Celeste said as Jacob's Stayed silent. The more the merrier, she added. That's exactly what I hoped you'd say, Jonathan replied cryptically. I've invited two guests. There and Corey shot each other looks, his attention in the room between Celeste and Jacob and Jonathan grew thick enough to cut with a knife. There, why don't you help me take the boys upstairs, Corey suggested. Lear nodded and quickly picked up Fabian, Corey, held Gabriel, as Lear, Corey, and the boys passed the drawing room door, Lear gasped as he saw who was standing behind it, Lear, Celeste, said, but Lear did not answer, he kept going past the door, leaving Jonathan to answer for him, I think he saw my guest, Celeste stood up to face her brother, what have you done, Johnny? She asked suspiciously. Jonathan stood aside and cleared his throat. And when he did, in walked Rebecca, Lord Castador, and her new husband, Caspian Castor, to the shock and horror of Celeste and Jacob. What is the meaning of this, mother? What are you doing here? What are both, what are both of you doing here? I'm home for dinner, of course, and I must say, son, I was feeling expected fulfilling expecting a bit of a surprise reaction from everyone but the disgust looks on your face are a bit distressing rebecca said i didn't frighten you dear did i she added with a sly look in her eyes rebecca i i don't know what to say celeste replied to her mother -in -law. rebecca walked over to Celeste and pulled her in for a kiss on each cheek you should say welcome home celeste in defeat whispered rep repeated welcome home Mother, this is incredibly outlandish. You're unwell and should be recuperating at the asylum. Then with him, answer me. What is he doing here with you? You should both be at the hospital. Were you both being treated? Where, where you're both being treated? This is dangerous thing you're doing, playing with your mental health. This is serious. Come, let's go. I'll have him said, take you back. Jacob interjected as he grabbed his mother by the arm. You'll need to you will need to let her go, Castor replied as he stood in his way. Do not speak to me, you monster. 
You're projecting, son, Rebecca said, projecting. It's a term I used in my many therapies at Churchill Green. But you should listen to Caspian, Rebecca replied as she shot Jonathan a look. Jonathan, Caspian, and Rebecca had recently entered into an alliance. They have eight joint forces against Jacob and Celeste in clever power move, as Jacob had recently consolidated all control of the family company when he forced Rebecca into the asylum and had her declared mentally incapacitated. All of it filed for fraudulently despite Rebecca's very real mental breakdown. Her past and temporary mental issues aside, Jacob had pers pers purposefully, personally committed his mother to take over the family company, and by all accounts, even Cassoon had returned to his natural self post-exorcism. Uh, Rebecca and Cassoon's quick marriage, too, would nullify Jacob's attempts at pulling power and money under his name, and heirs, as per Rebecca's late husband's Albert Lord's will. Getting back into her home, Terramore, with Jonathan's help, garnered Jonathan a key to Rebecca's rebuilt kingdom. These, this three-way power alliance was solid, and it flew in Jacob's fury face. Jacob turned to Caspian and spoke to his mother without looking at her. His eyes narrowed with disgust for the man in front of him. What are you doing exactly, mother? I could tell by the little glimmer in your eyes that you've come home to not retire as you should, but to be some kind of fly in my brandy, so go on, out with it. Tell me what this visits, visit with the devil here means to me. I wish you were as kind as you are arrogant, son, but that might be my fault that I raised you, pushed you to be this, this person, this greedy scoundrel of a person. I don't recognize anymore. Maybe I do recognize, but for some reason I tried to look the other way all these years. Rebecca, whatever you think happened, it was for the good of the family, Celeste replied. To Jonathan Scoff, she turned to her brother and gave him a look that burned a hole in a wall. Rebecca has been, has done all she could do to finally reach you. And I think this moment with the golden moment, Gold moment in this family's recent history. You'll see what she has to say for the best, Casper replied. I don't understand, Celeste replied as she looked to Jonathan again. Do you have something to do with this? I've just come to see Rebecca home. The three of us ran into each other in town, and she was admitted she wanted to be back in the home she loved, so I helped her, Jonathan replied. You don't have to worry, Celeste. I already know everything about Jonathan and who his father is. In times like these, I see family as family, and he's now family, thanks to Albert, and thanks to you, Rebecca added. You're insane, Jacob shouted, feeling the other shoe was about to drop, and his brand new empire was about to crumble. All of this is insane. I've made sure that the whole world knows it, and I'm calling Churchill Green, and I'm getting them to come up here and take you and this freak back to the hospital. Freak, Casper replied, chuckling at the word Jacob used. You'll find that these forms here, Rebecca began as she pulled a small folder out of the briefcase she had been carrying and handed it to Jacob the papers, will clear the both of us of anything you think we are insane is the word you're using. I'd say suffering from a belief, brief mental ailment that we've luckily recovered from. Jacob Celeste asked in confusion as she watched him go through the papers. This is preposterous, Jacob shouted. The hospital would need my approval of this. You're a menace, mother. A menace, for God's sake. We can't have you, you roaming around this mansion near the children, one of which you tried to kill, or did you forget that night at the lighthouse? Rebecca turned stone cold. I will never forget that. And this, this man, this thing, will you never forget what he did to you, to Aurora? Should I begin to remind you of those things? Your new friend has quite the history here at Tamworth. Perhaps I should refresh your memory, Jacob added. Your, laund your laundry list of my monstrous deeds fell in comparison to yours, Rebecca then said. 
No one in their right mind would have released the two of you from Churchill Green. This might be some sort of game, a trick of yours again. Casman, did you place them under some kind of devilish trance? Jacob asked. Casman's eyes narrowed. He hated his past and when he was possessed, something he could never forget or overcome. His neutrality as that monster would last longer than his own life. Yet Caspin remained calm and replied, The hospital has all ways of letting people find themselves once someone in attendance approves. The administration only needs the attending doctor or doctor to review our case, our mental capacity, and sign off on our discharge. You'll notice that it is all signed and officiated by the board of at Hope Hospital and by our attending doctor. No one was paid off, by the way. Cashin said N nothing, no noting how Jacob liked to pay his way to the top of judges and doctors and lawyers. Nick Jordan is a doctor, Aurora's own son. After what you did to his mother, you're telling me he signed this without a second thought, Celeste asked as she grabbed the forms from Jacob. Rebecca nodded. We had an agreement. I knew it. See? A trick, Jacob shouted. Not a trick. A trade. For our freedom. We were to help free his sister Evangeline. Yet another one of your illegal incarnations at a hill. Unfor at the hill. Unfortunately, the poor girl's premature death came before we could help her, Casman replied. Jacob growled at Casman under his breath. As Jacob and Celeste continued to look over the papers toward the door, Corey Tyler stood and listened, gathering more and more information, the light and fighting at Terramore for her brother Baxter, the journalist who was dying for intel on the family that paid his bills at the newspapers. She worried, of course, but if things got out, She'd be the first to get accused of leaking the story she knew now that she had to keep a low profile and not be seen. But on the landing of the staircase above her, Lear watched her eavesdropping and wondered what her own motives were, motivations were. Back in the room, Jacob's eyes widened as it came to the last bit of paperwork on Rebecca's father. This is, this is a lie. This cannot be true, he shouted. What is it, Celeste asked as she took forms from a shock Jacob you can't do this to our family I have I'll have you committed again this is proof that you're unwell Jacob said this to his mother and her new husband as Celeste snatched the forms from his hands it's shocking I know Jonathan said but it's all above board you know you knew about this Jacob asked turning to his scheming half-brother married Celeste shouted as she looked up from the papers she took from Jacob. I was wondering when you'd get to that part. That's right, man and wife, and in complete control of the house and business that I've always been in control of, Rebecca answered. It doesn't make sense. How does your marriage put the two of you in control, Celeste wondered. My late husband's will. Stated as much as much and since we filed our marriage just under the wire of the deadline, it was stipulated in his will. You'll note on the date that the this process was rearranged. Any illegal way the two of you have tried to take anything for, out from under the marriage, under the marriage is legal, binding, and by every single letter of the law, you can ask my untrustworthy nephew Lear. To look it over if you want, but trust me when I say it won't be broken. Albert's will is, is ironclad. Should I get married, Rebecca explained. What about your grandchildren, Rebecca? They'll be affected by this in the future, Celeste added, trying to figure out where her own son would stand in this new altercation of financial control. How dare you, Rebecca replied. I adore my grandchildren. All of them, I would never, ever try to take anything thing from any of their birthrights. Not like Jacob. He's the one that ousted at my poor Sebastian. And I saw nothing of Charlotte in the papers. He's the one who fights the rights of his, the heirs. So let's 
felt a sinking feeling in her stomach. She felt exposed and in danger of losing everything. She turned to Jacob, her facing panic and worried, I don't understand what did your father's will say. My father's will was a joke. He thought that should my mother marry again, it would put her in a better position with the board of trustees at the company because they'd be there'd be a man working with her. But we all know Oh, none of that matters, Mother. Has outlasted most of those trustees anyway. She just used the verbiage in the will to our maneuver us. A loophole. That is, all this marriage is the result of a loophole, Jacob explained. Rebecca smiled. How did I raise such a cynic? But he's right. A very old sexist idea that I could only run the company. Well, if a man was by my side, for years that was Jacob and the board, and Jacob turned into rich, fat cats while I did all the work. But now Jacob's little move on me is switched out from under him. The board will see Caspian as my equal now that we are married. I played right into their corporate mahogany playbook to my advantage, of course. Married or widowed, sane or insane, none of that matters. I control the family now, not you, Jacob. Shout it back as he yanked the papers from Celeste's hands and ripped them up in Caspian and Rebecca's face. There were copies, Caspian sent the official files and filed and secure with the courts. Get the hell out, Jacob growled. When should we go? Where should we go, Jacob? Should we sleep in the garden? Perhaps you could give my new husband and I a roll. Well, I bet to sleep in the gazebo. You remember the gazebo, don't you? You built it just a couple of years ago. It's lovely, Caspian. I'm sure you remember it. I certainly do. Jacob paused. He looked at his mother, who stood there while smirking at him with his arms crossed across her stomach. She was dangling the bait over his head for the body of Jacob's former con man, friend Gaspar de Poe, that Jacob had buried below the gazebo. Gazebo's grisly murder, or sorry, Gaspar's grisly murder, a mystery to the family, but he was Sebastian's very first victim. Jacob felt the need to hide the body, or the scandal and truth of their con artist connections would destroy them all. Jacob sneered at his mother. He was caught, stuck. No one would believe him if his own mother came to the authorities to tell them about Gaspar's body. He panicked right there in front of all of them and began pacing. Celeste had never seen him worry this way. It was frightening to her, to her too, as she felt he had always been confident and sure that nothing could topple them from power. Her status as the Lady of Terramore but as if it were on thin ice, and perhaps this would be the end of her. She feared what Jacob would do if he did, finally decided he didn't. Celeste, thanks to his mother, twist in the, the game. Celeste rushed over to Jacob, who was staring into the fire. We can fight them. He looked at... He looked. Had she held on his arm, he yanked on his arm out of her hold a bad sign for her this is not going to happen i will not let this madman anywhere near my bus the business my father built jacob shot up i want nothing to do with the company your mother has been running the business all these years and she's done well without the input of a man i'm just married to a woman that i love that's all Casman replied you bastard Jacob said, turning to Jonathan, who helped Rebecca and Caspian. I've given my father's wife what he wanted to her to protect his company, his legacy, Jonathan replied. I'm sure, Jacob replied with sarcasm, and I'm sure you'll be handsomely rewarded. Jonathan, please, tell me you didn't know about the, this after all we've given you. After all we wanted to do with you, we were a team. So I said, feeling betrayed. Jonathan looked at his sister strangely. They'd given him nothing, only the runaround. 
No one is losing anything, Rebecca chimed. Jacob, you'll stay in the company as you were before. You tried to take control. Jonathan, yes, will receive a better position in his, the company because he is your brother. A son by Albert, that's all we're doing. Jacob putting things back into the right place, that's all. Rebecca said as the family stood there in the bed, beat of silence. Outside, Corey hid behind a large pillar of the foyer as the housemaid, Jane, entered to call for dinner. They made quickly noticed the awkward silence and the two extra people. Miss Lord, Jane said with glee and confusion. Should I set two more places? It's Mrs. Lord Castador now, Jane. And yes, please reset the table for the two of us. Use the gold leaf china if you haven't already. This is a special occasion, I'd like to set. Oh, yes, Mrs. Lord. I mean, uh, Mrs. Lord Cassador. Imagine Jane, like, memorizing all the names. <laughs> yeah, I gotta write this shit down on the napkin. <laughs> like, Lord Cassador. <laughs> I would. I'd write that down. I'd, I'd like, yeah, I don't want to call anybody the wrong name. <laughs> Uh, poor, poor Jane. I feel bad for her. <laughs> I right before leaving, but paused as Jacob called her back. Jacob grabbed his drink, then the bottle of brandy, and passed it to his mother and new stepfather, who happened to be his age. I won't be at dinner. I've lost my appetite. Celeste quickly followed her husband. She'll probably not join us either, Rebecca said with a sarcastic grin. The room then fell silent, awaiting the china switch in the dining room as uh, Rebecca, Jonathan, and Caspian poured themselves a quick pre-dinner drink to celebrate. I hope you'll find the homes accommodating to you after what happened the last time you were here. I'm sure it feels a bit strange, returned Rebecca said, looking down into the amber-toned brandy. I'm doing my best to forget, Caspian replied. Um... I want to make sure that we somehow honor Sebastian and Evie. I think that what I did, and what Jacob did to them both, is a stain in this house. We should do anything, however small, to honor their lives, Rebecca added. A garden, maybe, this spring, Jonathan added. A garden, Rebecca said, smiling. Well, then Caspian said to his cohorts, as he raised for fresh brandy, Sebastian and Evie. And to new beginnings, Caspian said, to new beginnings, Rebecca and Jonathan replied as their glasses cleaned in a, in a toast. Uh, later that night, as the moon swam in its reflection over the bone-chilling winter sea, Morgan Thorne tossed and turned in his bed and his small room in Marion Phillips' cabin. He hadn't slept well at, well, a week, and his night, his new nightmare, was darker than any other he had been having. In his dream, Morgan walked alone in the forest grounds about the good family cabin. It was an odd night in his dream. He could see snow all around, the shadowy woods of night, the trees, the pine, beach, and oak were covered top to bottom, and with snow, too. He could see his breath. But the air was not cold, in fact, could not feel a single degree of winter's touch. Aside from the strange weather that could be seen as pleasant, Morgan could feel his anxiety growing. The woods were silent for the most part. He could uh, wrestling, yeah, he could hear wrestling in the bushes. He could feel something watching him deep in the dark of the forest. So Morgan sees a wolf in his dream. Uh, glowing amber and gold. His teeth were sharp and his belly empty. Morgan looks like a perfect meal. 
Wolf's growls grew louder and louder, almost booming as it echoed in the canopy of trees above Morgan. Don't turn, walk backwards slowly, Morgan told himself. In the cold snow, Morgan walked backwards. He saw his feet fell deep into the white, but he could not feel the ice, ice on his skin. He looked up, the wolf followed, and then he lifted his left paw and walked. Um, Morgan could see it was damaged. It was turned inwards and sim smaller than the other tree paws. Steady, steady, Morgan told himself. But the wolf's hunger was stronger and much more powerful than Morgan's steady heartbeat. Uh, the beast suddenly lunged upward and leaped into the air, following down on Morgan. A mouth, its mouth wrapped around Morgan's forearm as the boy attempted to protect himself from the many razor teeth. Morgan screamed in pain in his dream and suddenly woke up in his bed where Charlotte was shaking him awake by the same arm that was bitten in the nightmare. Are you all right? I heard you through the wall. You were screaming so loud, Charlotte said. Morgan sat up in his bed, sweating profusely. Wolves, I was dreaming of wolves. No, one wolf. He was so big. His eyes, they were like two gold coins on fire. It bit me in the arm, and I could feel, I think, I could feel its teeth go into my body. Charlotte recalled, you haven't been sleeping. Awesome, I'm going to make you something to help you sleep soundly. Or milk might not be here this time, she noted. A broken paw, mangled or something. Morgan said out of nowhere to Charlotte broken paw the wolf his left paw was deformed or something it was hurting him i think too much to each time he stepped toward forward toward me he was sort of turned in it was sort of turned inward charlotte walked back towards morgan in his bed her mind suddenly sparked with curiosity because of a very particular coincidence in his dream and in real life did you notice anything else about the wolf? She asked. Just his eyes and his paw. He was hungry too. I hope I don't go back to the wolf dream anytime soon. But the paw, Charlotte paused. It was the, his left paw mangled. Morgan nodded. Charlotte smiled and told her friend that she'd go to her mother now for help and his sleep aid, a drink Mary would make that would lure the boy into a full of sleep world of sleep. As Charlotte left the room to find Mary, she walked down the hall and wondered about the dream, the paw, the mangled paw. She realized the coincidence was perhaps just that. It wasn't even somehow she could think about it. Charlotte told herself it was nothing, she said to herself again, as she entered the living room and found Philip on the sofa reading a book late at night. Charlotte, everything all right? Philip asked his stepdaughter, as he put the book down and put his hands across his lap. And there it was, the coincidence Charlotte had been thinking about Philip's mangled left hand. It was due to the injury Philip suffered many years ago when he worked for Jacob, Charlotte's father, as his personal page. Jacob forced Philip into an automobile with him, and Jacob was drunk and chose to drive himself and not allow Philip who was sober to drive. The accident left Jacob with just cuts and bruises. All those years ago, he held fine. He held fine. The poor Philip's left arm with a broken arm and a hand that was mangled when he flipped the car and fell on it. Charlotte stared at his hand that she saw was formed with she had known Philip all her life. She always knew he, of his injury. It wasn't something strange or bizarre to her. But something in her psych mind told her never to ignore coincidences. The universe, the 14-year-old Charlotte knew at this age, <clears throat> young answer, would send us signs to tell us something, to warn us, to connect with us with reality or to forestall something 
for of the future. Uh, he senses his senses were telling her senses were telling her of the wolf in the dream that the mango paw was the same sort of sign coming from Morgan's nightmares to tell her about Philip. The wolf's paw, Philip's hand. Where the connection? What did it mean? Charlotte, Philip said. Oh, I'm sorry, it's Morgan. He's had another nightmare. Is my mother up? She's asleep already, but she put Caleb to bed and went to sleep. Is Morgan all right? Philip asked. Just a bit shaken. She answered, should I warn, warn him some milk? Philip asked. My mother would make something else that helped me sleep better than just milk, she said, off a frown, hoping to seek help from her mother, whom she remembered, making her a hot toddy when she was little and very ill right before Jacob took her from Mary. I think I can get some get him something, Philip smiled. She watched her kind hearted stepfather go into the adjoining kitchen and wonder where or how this is symbol of the wolf and Philip would meet. What did it mean? She kept asking herself. Then she realized it would be better to tell her mother of this dream. In the mean in the morning, her mother will with all her budding powers could help figure it out. That is, Charlotte said to herself, She'll help us. Um <clears throat> A shift in her body, she could feel the tightening of her muscles in her back like a pull of the rubber band. Minutes from snapping it was Evie laying in her coffin. She's still reaching and pulling in the lining of the lid with all she had in her. She could feel a strange choking feeling in her throat. It was crumbling anxiety suffocating her faster than the airtight coffin and it worsened the fear that she could never ever see the light of day again or worse beautiful face of her son gabriel as the uh, panic continued to wash over her again she began to kick and punch lids at the lid screaming at the top of her lungs begging for someone to hear in the ground she remembered reading in books in old dusty london libraries that when people died in early Victorian days, about 30 years before her own life began, and strange circumstances of the death that could not be explained by medicine. The family of the deceased would instruct the gravediggers to leave a long cord for the coffin that would connect to a bell above ground. Should the person awaken from her ailment, they'd pull the cord, ring the bell, hopefully be recovered before suffocation set in. Evie's mind was that desperate and in search of some kind of escape. She reached over her head to feel for a rope, nothing. She felt around the ridge of the lid for something to yank, nothing. There was no rope, of course. This was just something Evie hoped for. She wanted to feel this rope, this Hail Mary of an idea that someone would have thought of this and to create an idea of to free her own cold dark grave free her from her own uh, dark grave the jacqueline's spell of sleep had convinced everyone of evie's death no one would expect her to be alive and the air in the coffin was set to expire whenever the witch desired she could be there for weeks if jacqueline's disagreeably wanted evie had no clue as to when it would be over what did what did she know this was she would fight all the way to the end she continued to kick and scream her shoes became bend at the toes force of her uh banging on the lid from the bottom where her feet were uh <clears throat> hours and hours passed the night cold uh, dark air <laughs> buried in snow went or without even a sound of evie screams on the surface as the panic continued to wash over her in the moments her body began to react. She was exhausted. She couldn't bang and kick and punch anymore. Her voice, too, became a horse. She began to cry and slap to her face over and over again. It was all some nightmare induced by the medicine she was in a, on the Churchill Greens. 
with a slap she hoped would wake her up again in her hospital bed. Once more she was disappointed when she would not and could not find a way out of the coffin buried in a grave under the frozen ground. I can't breathe, she told herself. Her throat began to tighten again. Dear God, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe, she screamed as tears from, from her swollen, tired face. Her screams went on deaf ears to everyone except for those buried in the cemetery. There was one person who was trapped there. He, too, was locked in away in a secret crypt below the tomb. Tied up, locked away in a coffin under rocks placed by Jonathan Divini, lay the resolve of a calm Sebastian. He had given up on himself. He had decided this was his fate. This was the end. He'd lay there forever and let time take him as he was, a monster of the world of the undead. He would not fight it. He thought he would not go back to be to a world he could not live in any happily. What would be the point? What could be the reason? He had found his place, the final resting place in a grave. It was not his and decided to keep it. But he lay, but as he lay there, eyes closed, face pale and cold, he heard something far off in the distance as he thought it was his imagination. His vampire mind playing tricks on him. Get me out, Evie screamed. Sebastian's eyes snapped up, and he knew that voice. He knew it was Evie. He could feel her in a, in a way that had not been paying attention to. She was there. She was at the cemetery. Help me. Get me out of here. She continued to scream as, this, as she spit and coughed and struggled to the coffin, hoping to break the top as she could get it open. She could not. Evie Sebastian said in a whisper, Is that you? Dear God, help me, she shouted. It's Evie, it's Evie, Sebastian said to himself. As he too began to move in his coffin to get himself out. Evie's mind began to wonder. Her life was now shortening. She could see things in her memory faces. Her mother, her father, her brother, Sebastian, Charlotte, Matthew, Alice. Her baby, her sweet baby Gable. He was the face that... Leonard, most in her mind, would not leave her. Gabriel, my darling, my sweet boy. She said through a gasp of her tears and shortening breath, Forgive me for leaving you, she added. I never meant to. Sebastian rolled the coffin. He began to rock back and forth and forth and on the large stone. Catalophic? His coffin lay on the secret crypt. He, he moved and moved, and the coffin did too. When it rocked hard enough, the coffin fell off the stone cut the feet, and burst open. Sebastian fell into the several other coffins and were all broken, old and only bones and dust in them. He undid his, tie, he undid his ties, poorly secured him, and he sat up in a small space below. The trap door that Jonathan had secured with a large stone from the cemetery. Sebastian began to push and push and pound on the trap door in hopes he could get to Evie, wherever she was. I'm coming for you, Evie. I'm coming. Uh, later that night, over at the Siren's Call, speaking of a siren, uh, Jacqueline Gray uh, sat in the booth all uh, alone in a cigarette. Smoke swirled around her in a puff of white lit clouds on a gray winter morning. Uh, she sipped on a glass of white wine, wondering where she'd go and what she'd do next. Was Sebastian had abandoned her, she thought, or left her stranded at Lockwood Thicket without even a single word. No goodbyes, no explanation. Heartbroken and lost, she welled herself to order yet another drink. Uh, drown her sorrows, no spell, no magic elixir could fix a broken heart. She knew that only the sweet nectar of wine could do this for her, for the time being, of course. There was one thing she could do. She could relish in the fact that Sebastian hadn't run off with Evie. Evie, Sebastian's would-be widowed, was trapped in her coffin, safely tucked away under the frozen dirt of St. Thomas Cemetery, Away from all she loved, away from her child, Gabriel, away from her mother, her brother, 
And most of all, the best of all, if she asked Jacqueline away from Sebastian Lord. If Jacqueline could not have Sebastian freely and truly, uh, no one could. Evie would lay here and lay there in her grave, sorry about Jacqueline's powers, as long as time would last. She would not come to her rescue. It was too threatening to have Evie living in the world where Sebastian could return and take back his love. No, Jacqueline's cold jealousy was too strong an emotion for her to think in a rational way he preferred to let the woman she indeed die a real death in a coffin than to have her return to the surface and become involved with Sebastian once again. Uh, the fresh glass of wine arrived and Jacqueline thanked the barmaid as the door the sirens call open, letting in a swirl of snow and cold air. It was Jonathan Devinney who had come from Terramore to escape the while back and forth of the family drama. He ordered his own glass of frosty beer and looked around the bar. There were familiar town townspeople drinking there on the rose, but one new face that Jonathan had never seen. One specific beautiful face, Jacqueline's Gray's. Uh, the lonely Jonathan walked over to the equally alone Jacqueline and tipped his hat. Evening, he said. Jacqueline looked up from her wine. Uh, evening. I hope I'm not being improper, but could I join you? We're only we're the only two people here who seem to be on their own. I'd hate for us to miss a good conversation, Jonathan said with a grin. Jacqueline looked at, at him suspiciously and rewrapped her shawl around her shoulders. Very well, uh, she said. Um, Jonathan, he said, introducing himself. Jacqueline, what brings you here alone tonight? You know, he wondered. <clears throat> she obviously could tell him she was mourning her vampire boyfriend. Uh, she couldn't tell him that. And had buried the, his widow alive in, his cemetery, in the cemetery. She tilted her head and uh, sipped her wine. What brings anyone to a bar on their own? Heartbreak. Uh, Jonathan nodded in agreement. Me too. Well, it's been a while since she left, but the sting never really goes away, he said of Genevieve, who had left him months ago and vanished to England in search of David Lord, her kindred spirit. She, the woman you loved, left you? Jacqueline asked curiously. She did, he replied, of two parts unknown. Well, again, I do know she traveled to England to find another man, a man she doesn't even know, but feels she's in love with. It's a very single, strange, sorry, it's a very strange story, but a true one. You'd think she could find love with people she does know, rather than indulge in fantasies of somewhere she's only seen in portraits or photos. Sounds romantic to me. You're a romantic? Well, that's a good trait, Jacqueline. I like romance, too, but wouldn't you agree romance should be shared between two people who can look into each other's eyes face-to-face, -face, not from an ocean away, he asked. Jacqueline said, yes, I would agree with that. I'm sorry she left you. Uh, I'm not, he replied to her, surprise. But you're here drinking your woes away because of her. I'd say you are. He smiled with a boyish grin. Uh, maybe. She sipped her wine as the glow from the table's candle flicked in her eyes of chestnut brown, eyes so sparkling and beguiling that Jonathan was very, very interested in her. Uh, she was this beautiful woman he had never seen before. Her curly dark hair seemed run away, Jonathan. Uh, seemed to be floating in thickness, her skin such a beautiful uh, tone of mocha in her hands. She could tell uh, were delicate and soft and perfect in his eyes. Uh, but the witch who had done terrible things to Evie was as dangerous as she was beautiful. Her own loneliness was only pushed up by Jonathan's attention for the moment, and even through her heart, yearned for Sebastian. She was intrigued by Jonathan, who was very handsome and well-dressed, and had a smile that lit up a room. Sorry, smile. <clears throat> Did you come here to just sulk, sulk like me, he asked her. Uh, she shrugged. Perhaps, tell me, I've given you my bleeding heart story. 
Now you, he joked, ladies never kiss and tell, and they certainly don't sulk and tell. That's, let's just say my story isn't too off from yours, she answered with a sip of her wine and a sip of, as he sipped his beer. The world is full of broken hearts, Jonathan. We're just two in a million. A billion, she added, feeling the wine now sweep through her blood. I think that it'd be nice to make a new friend, us two in a world of a billion broken hearts. What do you think, Jonathan asked, reaching for her hand. She pulled away. Friends, she replied. Everyone deserves friends, she thought. What he was saying, she knew he meant more than that. She could sense how attached he was to her. And in truth, she was too. He, she could feel the energy oozing from him power of the sexuality filling the air and hers too grabbing on to that energy the alcohol helped they were two ships passing in the dark and they were they sought some attention some kind of physical attention and need that all humans need she lifted a brow and reached for his hand the same hand that had reached for hers a second ago and a bit and bit her lips slightly i love a new friend she said softly uh, but when she touched him, a flash of light hit her brain. In that light, she saw Jonathan beating someone. She saw him dragging someone's body. She saw him pulling that person, some sort of box or hole, the face of the person. She covered by shadows, obscured by some sort of shade. She could not see who Jonathan had, what she thought killed. She could tell him tell from the emotions she was feeling through the vi her vision she was in this was an act of violence that he had committed cruelly a way for him to get something for someone else it was not accidental murder the crime was fueled by darkness and greed she let go of his hand and stared at him she saw him in a blur and sort of felt queasy and not in her right frame of mind both of them were in slightly drunken stupors, uh, which made her quickly forget what she had just seen. Jacqueline, are you all right? Jonathan asked in a slow, slur of voice. What? Yes, yes, she replied. Would you like to um, maybe come with me? I'd, uh, he'd asked nervously. No, she replied with a lift of a brow. He nodded like schoolboy. She said she'd love to go home and to quickly left the Sirens Pub back to Terramore where they'd find new friends, maybe good bedmates. Um, so Rebecca visits Gabriel in the nursery. The clock on the main stairway of the mansion, a grandfather's uh, oak chested 1732 set, chimed 30 minutes after midnight. The house was quiet. Uh, sleeping couples held each other tightly as the cold wind outside hit the windows and frosted them with a winter's kiss made it steel. At the lights of the lone hallway were glowing in a dim orange Rebecca Lockwood, Lord Castle slowly made her way into a nursery. She had just come home and a triumphant return was shocking news for her family, but her heart ached. She was terribly sad about Evie's death and Sebastian's seeming disappearance. She knew of his, of his return a year and a half ago and wished she had treated him differently when she begged him to vanish from Welshport and leave EVB, a request of him that she felt horrible about. The shame in her heart for Sebastian Rebecca knew was unwarranted. She loved her grandson vampire or not. For her part, Sebastian stood firm and did not do as she asked, and Rebecca learned this one of the fateful nights on the lighthouse balcony when she came face to face with him in a surprise reunion, Rebecca wondered, had things been handled differently? Would she and so many of her family members suffered less? Um, <clears throat> she knew she was squarely to blame for Jacob's entirely wicked personality, but how much could she truly take on? Her guilt held her and would not let go. Let's see. As she stepped into the nursery, 
gave Rowan Fabian, who shared the room, slept soundly. She looked at her grandson Fabian and smiled. He was just as adorable as she had remembered. She and she kissed her little his little hand that poked out through the painted white bars of his crib. She crossed herself and prayed for God to protect little Fabian. She then remembered Charlotte, Fabian's 14-year-old half-sister, and Rebecca's beautiful granddaughter, and hoped to see her soon now that she was back. She then went over to little Gabriel and marveled at how much he had grown in the months that she was away at Churchill Green, then welled up with tears remembering how she could have killed him that night at the lighthouse. For what I have done, I will never forgive myself, little one, she whispered to Gables. But from the day forward, now from the day I woke, from the nightmare forward, I will do everything in my power to protect you and love you and will never allow anyone to hurt you again. I promise with this, Gabriel, my love, I promise you and God to the world, no one will do anything to hurt you for Gabriel's soul and for Evangelines. I will do this for them. Rebecca in her dark dress kneeled next to Gabriel's crib, her long white hair with hints of thick red locks that had yet to match the rest of her aged head was down and the curls swept her lower back in a cascade. She touched the little boy's hand and kissed it like she had Fabian watched him sleep. All the nursery door, Corey Tyler watched and listened to as Rebecca begged for forgiveness to the two boys out loud. She wondered how she could then go back home and tell her brother Baxter all the, of all. She wondered what she'd do with the information of the Lord once again in Terramore. <clears throat> and the seeing of Rebecca with the boys in the nursery. <coughs> Sorry. She knew how hard and painful life could be. She and Baxter didn't exactly grow up in a happy home. How could she now use the misfortune of this family as a way to shame them or embarrass them publicly? Baxter had his motives, but what were hers? Uh, she adjusted her thick winter coat and turned to leave, but almost jumped out of her skin when she was confronted by a six-foot-two Caspian who had seen her watching Rebecca the whole time. Did you find something interesting? He said in a whisper. Oh, but what? No, no, no. I was just checking on the police before I left for home. Uh, the night and saw Mrs. Castle, Mrs. Castle, I was there with them, and I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, Carolyn whispered back. I've been watching you this whole time, listening, Carolyn. You should be ashamed of yourself, Castman replied. Mr. Castle, I assure you, I meant no harm. I didn't listen. Yes, but only because I'm in charge of the boys, safely, and especially Gabriel. And you know as well as I do, Mrs. Uh, Castor's history, well, you'll forgive me for listening. What I wanted to do was to be sure the boys were safe. Of course, it has been lifted brown, decided to let her off the hook. Just go home, he whispered. At once, Ms. Mr. Hampstead is waiting for me downstairs, already to drive me back. Court. I wonder if Ham said, like, gets extra pay for people who complain to him. Like, I bet Corey, like, hey, that family's fucking weird. How do you work for them? Um, I don't get severance. Uh, past Caspian, who uh, grabbed her arm as she passed him and held out. Carolyn, he said. Her heart was beating so fast, he felt as if it jumped out of her chest. Sir, she replied, wherever you heard my wife say to those boys, that's between three of them, is that understood? No one, I mean no one, will know what you overheard, good or bad. Whatever it was Rebecca said was only meant for her grandsons to hear. Carolyn held deep, knowing a threat when she heard one no one needed and nodded her head. I understand, she whispered as Caspian's hands released her. Corey then quickly made her way <laughs> out of the hallway. She cut that tension with a fucking spoon. <laughs> um, the main staircase and into the awaiting freezing car that would drive her home in the middle of the night. 
uh, to her safe bed, Carolyn had a lot to think about in this cold January night. But she finally gave in to her to cunning reporter Brother Baxter's demands, her secret intel on the Terramore house, in the Terramore house, or but she disappointed him to keep the family secret in her safe, in her life, safe and sound. Uh, uh, really, really good. So, Jacqueline's too drunk to realize that uh, Sebastian is, was buried in the coffin. Uh, she's going to hook up with Jonathan. So, Jacqueline back at Terramore. Oh, shit. Things are going to go bad. Uh, I think. Uh, really, really good. Guys, Go to, if you've not checked out To Be Night and Big Alba now, please go check it out. It's a really well-written story. Uh, I'm going to try to get John Philip Betancourt back on here to interview him for this. This is really, really good stuff. Uh, go check it out. Link's going to be in the description box. You guys have a great, great rest of your day.